New Hampshire has rapid, have rapidly evolved over the past 48 hours. On Friday, we declared a proactive state of emergency that allows us to take preemptive measures to ensure that we have the resources and the flexibility available to respond to this developing health emergency. For many people, and especially our kids, this can be a scary time. There's a lot of uncertainty with what's going on. Our job is to ensure that the people in New Hampshire are safe, they're comfortable, and they're informed. Over the coming days and weeks, more announcements will be made as the situation is constantly evolving. It's important to remain calm, to really be there for our kids, to come together as a community in this moment of crisis. The goal with our communities and with our children is to be resilient, not to panic. Our kids will remember how their homes felt a lot more than they'll remember the actual impacts of the virus. The community and the spirit of the Granite Staters is unmatched, we know this. And when we work together as neighbors and friends, we do it really, really well. I'll now turn it over to Ben Chan for an update on the evolving data and how our actions are designed to limit community transmission. <clears throat> Thank you, Governor. Let me start by first giving an update in terms of the number of cases of COVID-19 which have been identified or diagnosed in New Hampshire. Uh, today we are announcing um, a total of 13 individuals in New Hampshire with COVID-19. That is an, addition, uh, an additional six individuals since our last report on Friday. Um, all of these new cases are believed to be travel related, um, either international travel, as is the case with four individuals, or domestic travel, uh, as is the case with two of the individuals. Um, I also want to make mention that uh, late Friday evening we announced a seventh case, um, but had not identified sp or announced specific risk factors for that individual. Uh, we have since learned through our public health investigation uh, that the case we announced on Friday uh, did have domestic travel uh, in the days prior to illness onset, and so we believe that the seventh case uh, is likely to also be a travel-related infection. So to summarize, in total, we have 13 COVID-19 cases identified in New Hampshire. All of them, we believe, are either travel-related or are identified uh, close direct contacts to someone with a uh, COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, none of these individuals uh, are hospitalized. They are all at home with more mild illness. Um, there are now more than 150,000 global cases of COVID-19 and close to 3,000 cases of COVID-19 in the United States, including the 13 individuals identified now in New Hampshire. Um, as COVID-19 increases globally and as we see spread uh, throughout the United States, we can expect more diagnoses of COVID-19 in New Hampshire in the coming days and weeks. Uh, it will become increasingly difficult to determine specific risk factors for acquiring COVID-19. And so it's very likely we're going to see um, additional diagnoses of COVID-19 where we are unable to or have difficulty identifying specific risk factors. So in short, there may be um, additional COVID-19 cases in the coming days uh, where there is not a clear identified risk factor um, and there may be evidence of community transmission. I think that's expected given the rapidly expanding global outbreak in multiple other countries as well as the increasing numbers of cases within the United States, uh, including um, in states surrounding New Hampshire. In this setting of uh, the new coronavirus pandemic, um, I want to stress and iterate that we need everybody's help uh, to help prevent spread of this new virus and to protect our families and our communities uh, that we live in and those who are most vulnerable. So it's our collective responsibility to help slow the spread of COVID-19 in New Hampshire and around the United States. Now, there's been a lot of discussion and speculation about um, how COVID-19 spreads. There has been some discussion and concern that there may be asymptomatic transmission of COVID-19. And I want to um, reiterate that um, we know, and as I've said previously, we know from case reports in the scientific literature that um, transmission of COVID-19 is certainly and likely possible um, before someone develops symptoms. Uh, but we still believe that the main driver of this pandemic is in individuals who are symptomatic and exposing other people. This includes people who may only have very mild symptoms of COVID-19. 
So we also know that people with COVID-19 um, can shed virus or spread virus from their respiratory tract even very early in the course of illness uh, when viral shedding may be, um, may be high. Um, fever and cough and difficulty breathing are some of the primary symptoms that have been described in people with COVID-19. Uh, but these symptoms may not be the first signs or the first symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, in fact, fever may not develop until several days into illness. Some of the very early signs of COVID-19 can include more vague or general flu-like symptoms, including someone feeling just simply tired, run down, maybe having a headache, uh, having chills but without a fever. Um, we know that people can transmit this new coronavirus even with those very early and very mild symptoms. Uh, therefore, I just want to stress that it's important for people to take appropriate steps and precautions to protect our families and our communities and at the first symptoms of not feeling well to stay home. This should involve employers who uh, screen their employees for symptoms before work and if employees are identified who are maybe feeling unwell or having mild symptoms, they should be sent home. So I think we need to change our social expectations and make it okay for people to go out, make it okay for people to um, stay home when they are sick or symptomatic, even with only mild symptoms. Um, as you can see on the chart on my right, um, most of the people who get COVID-19 will only develop very mild symptoms. In fact, more than 80% of people who have been found uh, to have COVID-19 uh, do not require hospitalization and have very only mild symptoms um, and recover at home. That is, in fact, the case uh, with the 13 individuals in New Hampshire who are all isolated at home. None of them have required hospitalization. But I do want to point out that there are certain groups that are at higher risk. So what we've seen from the national and uh, global pandemic is that anywhere about 15 to 20 percent of people will have more severe illness and require either hospitalization for supportive care, such as oxygen or intravenous um, hydration and fluids, or potentially more critical level care um, in, an, in an intensive care unit. These populations that are at highest risk for more severe illness are those who are of an older age, uh, that being individuals 60 years of age and older, um, and people with multiple medical problems or chronic medical problems, regardless of the age of the individual. It's these individuals in particular that we want to try and protect within our communities. And so even if someone is only having mild illness, they can still likely transmit it to others. Um, hence the need to take uh, special precautions to protect our more vulnerable populations. Um, Anybody that does fall into this higher risk group, meaning people that are 60 years of age and older or people with chronic medical um, conditions, we urge them to avoid large gatherings and practice social distancing. We also urge them to avoid any um, non-essential international or domestic travel, uh, which is consistent with current CDC guidance. And I would instruct everybody, if they're considering traveling, to uh, review the guidance on the CDC webpage. There's been a lot of discussion about um, whether we can contain this virus or whether we're going to try and mitigate the spread. And I want to emphasize again that it's really not one or the other. Uh, we are continuing with our containment efforts to limit the spread of this virus, while at the same time working with our healthcare systems to make sure that they are prepared for any needed surge in patients and uh, patients who need more intensive care or hospitalization. There is another graphic on my right up here which looks at the goals of mitigation, uh, which have three general goals. One is to delay the outpeak, uh, to delay the peak of an outbreak and slow the acceleration of uh, new cases coming into our state. We want to reduce the number of cases and the burden on our healthcare system so that our healthcare systems and emergency departments don't get overwhelmed. And we want to reduce the overall number of infections and health impacts uh, within our population. So again, I want to stress that with these uh, new identifications, um, all of them we believe are either travel related or connected to um, uh, or are a direct contact of someone diagnosed with COVID-19. We will continue our public health efforts to investigate and try and slow and contain the spread of this virus. But again, it's likely we will see increasing number of cases in the coming uh, days and weeks. Uh, and so we are working with our community partners, with our healthcare systems, with our state partners uh, in order to 
reduce the impact of this global pandemic on our communities and citizens and residents uh, of New Hampshire. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to the governor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Well, thank you very, very much, Dr. Chen. Um, so given these very serious developments, uh, our understanding is that this is clearly an a rapidly evolving situation. Today I'm directing all schools in New Hampshire to transition to a remote learning environment effective immediately. Many school districts are already prepared. Others will need a few days to begin. Regardless, every district will have one week to fully transition to this new learning environment. The Department of Education stands ready to assist all schools in bringing these efforts up to speed so that the education of our children in New Hampshire will not be disrupted. We have worked many years to be a leader in remote learning, and Commissioner Errol Blute and his team again are to be commended for their efforts. They put us in a very strong position to take these actions today. We work very carefully to ensure many of the other issues that surround this change are addressed, such as food insecurity, workforce issues, IEPs, child care, child welfare services. All of these issues have been worked over the past few days and frankly the weeks and months leading into this uh, by Commissioner Edelblu and his team at Department of Education to make sure that we're going to be there for these kids. This directive will remain in place for three weeks through April 3rd and following that we will reassess the situation on the ground. However, districts need to appreciate that they may remain in this situation for an extended period. So to be clear, while students will not be in schools, they will be learning and education in New Hampshire will go on. I'll now ask Commissioner Edelblu to join us to talk about some of the details of the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, I would first like to commend our school leaders of New Hampshire who have been working tirelessly, really, to be able to um, tackle the circumstances that are on the ground and the exigent circumstances that we find ourselves in, to be creative, to be innovative in terms of working towards solution so we can continue to work with our students and our families. Um, it is a vo an evolving circumstance on the ground. Um, and so I want to describe what we mean by uh, you know, changing the environment in which our students will, in, will learn. And that includes the idea of remote instruction plus remote support results in remote learning for our students. We all know that students are always learning and our goal is to help them learn the important knowledge and skills that will bring them all to bright futures. Relative to remote instruction, on February 12th, this last Thursday, the State Board of Education passed an emergency rule that allows schools to implement remote instruction in their learning environments. Um, the range of implementation with regard to remote instruction we know will be quite broad. There are some districts who are up and running at a moment's notice. They are fully digitized and are able to deploy technology in ways that can engage their students. Other districts are going to be using um, hybrid methods of some Chromebooks and some uh, you know, instructional materials that will be analog, and some districts may be fully analog. I sometimes uh, joke with some of the superintendents that we have that it was not too long ago that some of us lived in a world which did not have uh, you know, computers in ubiquitous um, you know, ways and we managed to learn quite well. So we are working with our um, schools in many ways. We have rolled out a number of tools to them and we are continuing to roll out a number of tools in support of our schools. Particular emphasis in this instructional and this remote instructional model is on the digital divide and making sure that we do not leave any of our students behind. Relative to remote support, there are two areas of focus. One is relative to some of the food programs that we have in our schools for some of our needy citizens. Early on in this process, the Department of Education applied for a waiver. We received, that waiver was granted to us and received the waiver yesterday that really, from the USDA, that allows broad flexibility in terms of how we prepare and distribute food through our food programs. Another aspect, really, of remote support deals with our students that are on individual education plans. And so we are finding ways in order to be able to continue to support all of our students, particularly our students that may have a learning disability. That may mean that the service that is called out in their plan can be provided in a remote instructional environment, and we will continue to provide it that way. It may mean that some of those services 
need to be done in person. In those cases, we will continue to work as a school and bring in students in limited cohort sizes, maybe even one or two or five, to be able to provide those individual education plan services in that school environment. And then finally, there may be some services called for in an IEP that we are simply not able to provide in a remote support model. And in those cases, we will work with the individual students on compensatory services. Now, our plan, as the governor alluded to, is that beginning tomorrow, students will not show up at school. So starting on March 16th for up to one week, uh, schools will be preparing remote instruction and support. I can tell you, having had conversations with many of our schools across the state, some already having launched into remote instruction and support, some needing one or two days to launch into remote instruction and support, and others may take the entire week to prepare to do remote instruction and support with their students. That implementation go live will be next Monday. Um, at which point uh, remote instruction and support will be available ubiquitously across the state is our objective. Uh, that time frame for that will last through April 3rd, at which point we will reevaluate the situation on the ground and determine what we will do, recognizing that the disrupted model and the remote instruction and support may last through the end of the semester. We recognize that this is a disruption, not only for our students, but for our parents, for employers, for our school leaders, our educators who have worked diligently to prepare curricular materials for their students, and they are working tirelessly to adjust and to be flexible to be able to deliver high quality educational opportunities to our students. I think it is vital that we continue to work uh, within our communities and support one another throughout this public health emergency. We all have a role to play, and I am proud of how the education system has responded to this, these circumstances. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, I mean, this has been an, a really an all-hands effort across the state. We can't thank the folks that within the Department of Education, the superintendents, all the way down to the principals in a lot of these districts uh, for help laying the groundwork for this statewide, uh, as well as giving the feedback uh, to us uh, kind of at the top level to make sure that we're, we're working out all the kinks and the bugs as, as we go forward. But uh, we have a, a lot of hopes that this is going to be very successful for everyone uh, across New Hampshire. So we don't take today's actions uh, regarding uh, going into a remote learning atmosphere lightly. We know that parents and family members will need additional supports. So with that in mind, in the next 48 hours, I'll be issuing directives which will ensure that parents needing to miss work for the care of their children at home will be able to access state unemployment benefits. For those who are unable to stay at home, we'll expand access to child care. Pursuant to the executive order I issued on Friday, Commissioner Shibinet will work to take steps to provide flexibility and licensing for daycare facilities to allow a business to provide temporary child care for their employees if they so choose, and to increase the maximum enrollment for current operating child care facilities across the state. And while our students are away from their schools, we'll be actively preparing for their return, and specifically, we'll be setting aside funds to assist with districts who may need financial help so that all vacant school facilities can be deep cleaned and sanitized to ensure that our children are returning to a safe educational environment. In closing, we are taking unprecedented action today as a state to help manage this evolving public health situation. There are moments in one life that is truly transformational, and it's important, as is one's education, and we're doing everything we can to ensure that kids still receive the education that they deserve across New Hampshire. We understand that this may be tough on some individuals, and we're doing everything we can to mitigate those concerns and those fears. We're making funds and resources available. We're implementing innovative solutions to ensure the, that effective individuals receive financial resources to help their families get through the public health emergency. And. I also want to note we're, we're hearing some great stories. It's something that we were talking about before we were coming in here. Uh, we see a lot of the stories in the media right now of the run on supermarkets and, and all of this. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are some amazing stories out there. We had, um, I took a note this morning of a gentleman in Manchester who went and purchased cof coffee for the entire supermarket employees. I thought that was great because they are working around the clock to restore the, the re, uh, restock those shelves. We are st heard stories uh, across the state of neighbors checking in with the, one another, sharing their resources, sharing their supplies uh, with other folks and neighbors and communities uh, who might not have been 
able to, to access some of the cleaning supplies or whatever they needed for their homes um, uh, or their organizations. Our, our nonprofit organizations are being flooded with folks who are calling in, who want to volunteer, who want to step up, who want to donate their time, who understand, again, that that community involvement that we cherish so much in New Hampshire, uh, when done right, uh, there's nothing that, that we cannot get through. Uh, so it's an all hands on deck effort. It demands both our individual responsibility to our families, our collective support to our neighbors. We can do it and we will do it. With that, uh, we'll conclude and we can take any questions from the press. So our food programs, again, as I described, because we received the waiver, have given us a great deal of flexibility in terms of how we would go about continuing those food programs to support students. Um, that will look different in each community. So for example, in my initial conversations with Manchester, they had the concept of using their bus drivers who otherwise might not be deployed to be able to do runs and drop off food at individual residences. Uh, just coming in here, we received a call from, I believe it was the Rockingham County Sheriff's Department uh, that suggested that the Sheriff's Department would be willing to make some of those runs and do those drop offs in the community. So I think we have a number of opportunities for uh, these food programs to continue to support really our at need, our at risk individuals. I don't I have the number of so I, I can tell you that 27.5 percent qualify for free and reduced lunch but our food programs extend beyond that in some of our after school programs as well so it's going to impact a, a broader number of students overall but I do know that that's kind of a, a number that might help you so if, if I'm reading the chart correctly over there commissioner it says that six percent of schools where students will not be able to potentially avail themselves of distance learning due to schools, districts, inability to get that up and running by the end of the school year potentially? Yeah, so actually this chart reflects a survey that we took before we took our action. So what we did is we went out to the schools and we assessed their capacity to be able to implement remote instruction and remote support for their communities of students. Based on that, what we heard back from schools is that they would need some ramp time in some of those locations. So hence, in this order, we've set aside an entire week for schools to get ready to be able to implement. And in that survey, again, which was done before the order, what we heard is generally, and I've spoken with most of the schools, they needed one, two, maybe three days to get ready. We set aside a week for schools to be able to get themselves ready. Uh, in the case of the one district, they had not made plans for that at that time when we did the survey. So now we are leaning in and engaging with them to help them come up to speed too. And when was that survey taken? That survey was taken on, I think it was Saturday, Friday or Saturday this week. Yeah. Okay. And so during the week in which schools can prepare, are teachers going to be expected to be working in, their, in the schools? Exactly. So it's going to be localized, but in general, the teachers will still be showing up at school, working with one another in learning communities to be able to stand up these uh, distance and remote instruction and support capabilities. How does the state's decision to close all the schools comport with the latest CDC guidance, which I was looking at this morning, it doesn't seem to be on the same page. Sure. So again, you know, we're taking actions today based on the fact that we have increasing numbers here in the state. They're likely to continue to increase. Uh, while not confirmed yet, we suspect at some point you, you're, you could be looking at a community transmission um, uh, I'll use the word outbreak, but again, you know, uh, these are, can be localized, they can be smaller, but we're just trying to be proactive, uh, looking at what's happening in the current community today, as well as being proactive so we can be nimble. Um, we wouldn't necessarily be taking this step if we weren't so prepared, frankly. I've talked to other governors in other states. Uh, they're trying to get up to speed, similar to, to as we are, but the fact that we have so many districts that are already prepared, that have worked with um, Commissioner Elblut, the fact that you, again, you had a very small number of districts, even before we made this order, that were concerned about it, we can really, as, as uh, commissioner, the commissioner put it, lean in with those districts, work with them directly. We have full confidence that we have the ability in one way or the other, whether it's digital or analog or a combined uh, hybrid 
uh, uh, model going forward, we can get these districts up and running. And that's an amazing opportunity that we have, which makes the decision to go to this for the next three weeks much easier. And again, we'll, we'll reassess. With CDC guidelines. You the CDC is, is looking at it from a national perspective. My job is to look at the 603, our abilities, our capabilities, and our flexibility, and we're in a very advantageous position to make this move right now uh, and ensure that learning will continue. So what do the new cases, um, what are the implications for the state's ability to mm -hmm investigate those the staffing needed to properly attend to the cases yeah, no, it's my understanding that we have staffing. Uh, staffing has, has been available. Uh, and I'll say before I bring Dr. Chan and, and or Commissioner Shibanet up, um, I think our staff at the Public Health has done a phenomenal job. We are moving on the investigative aspect of these cases incredibly rapidly. Uh, we, we get the results. We start the investigations. In a matter of hours, we are out there talking to the individuals and, and doing the investigations around them so we can get them isolated. And just as someone who is not, uh, uh, work, does not work directly in that field, it is amazingly impressive uh, how fast we can, we can move and the staffing, uh, the, the efforts of those staff have, have really been unbelievable. Sure. Yeah, th thank you for that question. And, you know, anytime we respond to an infectious disease challenge like this, it really is a, a team a team based approach that involves not only, you know, state agency leadership, um, but dozens of people, um, nurses, epidemiologists, support people that are um, on the ground answering phones, doing the investigations. And sometimes these investigations take time. Um, a lot of times it's an iterative process, meaning we have to go back multiple times uh, to talk with people to figure out what, you know, their contacts may have been, what, what social settings they, have may, they may have been in. Uh, so we, we certainly have uh, quite a few people that are um, committed to doing this work and we will continue to um, investigate to identify uh, those who may be at risk and um, try and minimize and slow the spread of this virus. Um, but as the governor just mentioned and as I mentioned previously, uh, it's likely given the increasing number of cases globally and around um, uh, in, in states surrounding New Hampshire that we're going to see um, more cases and we will continue to investigate those um, while we continue to work with our local health care partners or schools or health care providers to try and mitigate the, uh, the impacts of this virus. Thanks. Governor. Governor. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, let me grab this one if you don't mind. Sir, yes, sir. I, I have three questions. First off, um, the, uh, uh, I really appreciate your comments about the, the resiliency of the community. Um, but as we've seen at Market Basket Shaw's and other stores, there's been a run on a number of items. It's really better to have a coordinated volunteer opportunity versus, say, everybody doing things on their own. If, if, is it time for, say, a, civilian, a CCC like California has or an old civil defense mechanism? Not necessarily the National Guard stocking shelves. Have you talked to Market Basket and yes. those companies and say, hey, do you need 10 more mm -hmm. employees to come in between midnight and 6 to stock shelves? Or do they just don't have anything? Yeah. Uh, so let, let's be clear. Uh, I, I, I've talked to both the supply chain, the folks in the supply chain, so many of the grocery stores themselves. I was in a market basket a couple nights ago walking. There is food on the shelves. Let's be very clear. Um, there's plenty of eggs and bacon and milk and things of that nature. There is clearly a run on things of uh, more paper products, some of the toilet paper we've seen, flour, bread. There are a few items where the shelves are going bare, but those products are being manufactured and they're coming in. They are being bought at a high rate right now, we know that, but they're also being come in. The supply chain is there. So we're no near, nowhere near a level uh, of panic or anything like that. I think we're going through a, a, a people are stocking up, of course, um, again, in the case of emergency. But I think as Dr. Chan was alluding to with our, our actions today are really about stretching this, this situation out as opposed to having a run not just on the healthcare system but on our services and supplies in our community, even our grocery stores. And as we take these actions and flatten that curve, I think there's going to be a real normalization. If we get to a crisis point, of course the state stands ready to do whatever we have to do, but we are nowhere near that level right now. And I think that's one of the messages here is that the, don't worry as much about the, 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 the lack of toilet paper on a shelf today as I think the responsibility we all have in our community to take a collective breath, to understand that you know our actions, uh, as they're seen in this case today, we're talking about kids and students, um, they're watching, right? And how we act as the adults, if, if you will, uh, is very representative and can set a tone and example uh, in terms of how to respond to an emergency situation. It's very serious. It is an emergency. But all the more reason we have to kind of take that collective calm, take a breath. And I think as we do that over the, the coming days and into the next weeks, I think you'll see kind of an evening out of, of the supply chain. Thank you. Second, um, to either you or Commissioner Edelblu, um, I had a number of conversations with superintendents and communities that I, uh, that I deal with 
Um, specifically, the second largest school district in the state is very concerned about the lack of infrastructure. Uh, students do not have Chromebooks like they do in other communities. They take them off of a cart. Uh, some, of the, some of the individuals, residents, don't have access to internet. Um, you signed an exe you know you signed an emergency order uh, for 21 days. Are you going to say purchase laptops for X <coughs> district if they don't have any or anything like that? Can you get into that? Okay, Please. so uh, I think that you're referring to a district down south in particular, and so I have personally spoken to the superintendent of that district to work on plans to roll this out. That is a district that shows red over here that had not made previous plans uh, in the eventuality of having to do this. So again, have worked with him uh, to begin to formulate what that might look like. It does include uh, reaching in with some of our federal funding, whether that's on Title II or Title IV, to be able to support that district, both in terms of the technology to implement it, but it's really beyond technology because truthfully you can implement an analog lesson plan that can work particularly in a high density area like that um, but to help the educators figure out how do they conduct instruction like that so we feel comfortable working with them and moving that forward well while you're still there commissioner on um, you came under fire when you were first nominated due to the fact that you raised your own kids remotely um, do you have any personal advice that you can give parents, such as myself, who are immediately going into working and trying to educate our kids and making sure there, and I'm, there are thousands of us now, uh, about that experience, what we can do, and how we can focus to make sure that they aren't lost during, whether we, there's a div digital divide or not, that they don't lose what could be more than three weeks, right? Yep. So as we have worked on the plans relative to remote instructions, um, one of the areas that we have emphasized is around the curricular, the content, and that's something that the school system has a lot of experience with and has worked very uh, diligently at, and I feel like they're in a really good place there. We are also providing guidance to the districts to be able to provide to parents who now are going to find themselves supervising learners, and what does that look like and how can they be successful in that role? What about um, private child care centers, daycare, does this cover that, and if not, is the state recommending that they take the same action? Yes, thank you, Senator You mean uh, in terms of this action today does not cover private child care and daycare centers. Um, uh, again, those are smaller um, organizations, if you will. Uh, they don't have hundreds and hundreds of kids uh, that, that we're dealing with in the, in the larger populations. Uh, if anything, in some of these areas, we can uh, actually expand uh, the opportunity to have more kids uh, in those facilities, um, within reason, of course, uh, to make sure that the workforce uh, fluctuations that may be happening uh, over the coming weeks are, uh, can be dealt with. As far as the 13 cases go, Dr. Chen, how many have recovered so far? What's the recovery <coughs> process and what's the recovery rate? Uh, yeah, so, so great questions about recovery of people with COVID-19. Um, most people um, only have mild illness and, and will recover. Uh, a certain percentage of individuals over the course of the first week um, can have symptom progression. Uh, and so we encourage people that if they do have COVID-19 to very closely monitor, monitor their symptoms over the course of that first week. And if they have any worsening of symptoms, they should be in touch with uh, their healthcare facility, healthcare provider, because they may need supportive care in the hospital. Um, but you're right, as of now, all 13 individuals uh, currently are still isolated at home. Um, many of these individuals, uh, most of these individuals have only mild symptoms and some of them are recovering. The protocol for taking someone off home isolation involves uh, doing serial nasal swabs and testing in our laboratory to see if there is still evidence of virus in their nasal passages. And so what we've seen and heard from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and other states is that this process of, you know, once people start to improve, once their symptoms get better, and collecting the, 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 no, uh, the nose swabs or the nasal passage swabs can take, you know, up to a couple weeks oftentimes before the tests are consistently negative and they can be let off isolation. So that is something we're still working on with um, the, the people that have improved with COVID-19. Uh, nobody has been let, let off isolation yet. Um, we also understand that there may be some type of medical tent set up at the Manchester Armory. Is that being looked at as a testing site, maybe an overflow site? Can you explain what that might be? So, so one of the things that we are doing to support our communities and the local healthcare infrastructure uh, is to um, try and offer a mobile testing service. So let me clarify, not testing, mobile sampling site. Right. Most hospitals um, 
and cannot do the actual test, but what healthcare providers and hospitals can do is collect samples, the, the nose swabs, to do the test at our public health laboratory or at one of the uh, reference or commercial laboratories that has brought on the COVID-19 testing. What we've heard from um, healthcare providers and facilities is that they are getting overwhelmed with people with uh, respiratory symptoms because these are very common symptoms. Uh, people um, wanting to come into the uh, emergency departments for testing, and there's just a backlog of people. And, and uh, um, healthcare facilities are having trouble keeping up with the demand for sampling and testing. And so, one of the things that we have done to support uh, the hospitals and the healthcare um, infrastructure is to develop a group of volunteers who are able to go out, um, mobilize within a community to do. Um, some, some sampling, uh, which we then send to our public health laboratories for testing. And so that is um, over the weekend, over this weekend, uh, our mobile group of healthcare volunteers has been set up in Manchester doing some of that sampling. I, I want to stress and th that this is not just open to the public, right? In order to um, undergo sampling and testing for COVID-19, it requires an assessment by a healthcare provider um, and a decision based on the guidance we've put out um, on, on who we think should be prioritized for testing, that healthcare provider should then contact us or refer the patients uh, for testing to a local healthcare facility that can do the sampling um, to send to either a reference laboratory for testing or to our public health laboratory for testing. As, as far as uh, private schools go, I'm assuming they're under this closure as well. Are you working with them during this process as well? We are. The private schools have been involved with us all along and have received all of the same supports and guidances that we have been putting out from the department. What's your message to the healthcare workers who have school-aged children at home who just found out that they're vitally needed, we need them to screen these people, we need them to prepare for emergency, oh, but by the way, you have kids at home now because we just closed your schools. Sure. So um, we know that that's going to be, I mean, it's not just healthcare workers, it's workers all across the state, right? For the tens key, of, obviously, at this time. They are. They are. So again, we're providing a lot of the flexibilities. Um, we've actually heard from hospitals that have asked, hey, can we set up a, a child care or daycare center within our facility uh, temporarily uh, so that, again, those workers can be at, at work? And that's exactly the type of flexibility we're going to give them. Examples like that. Now, as si different situations arise, um, we can deal with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. One thing about New Hampshire is we're, we're nimble. Uh, uh, we, we know all whether it's a hospital or a health care a direct health care provider uh, we know most of them by by name and they have direct contact with us so um, again that's one of the reasons we can take this this uh, initiative whereas other states may be uh, frankly a little more problematic because I think we're, we're pretty ahead of the, the ball game here and we're really looking at all the different indirect effects that could come with it uh, the, whether whether their workforce issues um, that may revolve around uh, finances, right? We want to make sure that folks can access unemployment insurance so that they're paying their rent, they can keep the lights on, all those basics, while they might be taking uh, home, taking care of themselves. Um, also looking at what the federal government was, was looking to do with paid leave. Uh, we also have a plan to, that we're going to be announcing in the next couple of days that allows our, our unemployment fund to also uh, impact in a very positive way the ability for individuals to take care of loved ones. So uh, we want to make sure that finances are not a barrier in this situation at all. Uh, and again, the the state of emergency allows the, the governor and uh, to, to take those actions as necessary. And again, it's not just we're going to put some money out. We've really thought through how this could go. But we'll be getting feedback from folks all across the workforce industry to see what flexi other flexibilities we can provide to make their lives as easy and smooth so as possible. Can you walk through the, that unemployment fund and how that works? Um, so that executive order will be issued in the next day or so, and again, at that time, we'll be able to provide uh, a lot of the details. We'll have folks from uh, Department of Employment Security. Uh, we want to make sure that it's matching up and coinciding with whatever the federal government is doing. It looks like there will be a federal package moving forward uh, very shortly. I just got off the phone a, a little bit ago with um, Congress, uh, Congresswoman Andy Custer, Congressman Chris Pappas, uh, Senator um, uh, uh, Hassan, and I had a, had a long conversation about all these different uh, aspects just literally an hour ago. And so we feel very confident there's a lot moving in Washington, and that's a very good sign, but we want to make sure it complements. But it's literally within a day or so that we'll be able to come back, uh, provide those details for both employers and individuals, and show the opportunity we're going to make sure. Happens, so. What is the rollout? So once you issue the executive order, how quickly can people access these benefits? Immediately. Immediately. Yes. There's, That's no, there's no week or two weeks away. No, we think we can get this up and running virtually immediately. And how would the process, I know that you haven't announced it yet, sure. but, but, but what's the general process for uh, the state kind of um, uh, I'm going to hesitate. We'll go through all the details of that in particular uh, in the next day or so. So, but that's it's an exciting movement and exciting opportunity that we can provide folks. Just yeah. to circle back on the numbers, um, Dr. Chan. So, um, the <coughs> website hasn't been updated since nine o'clock yesterday morning. 
So you have 13 positives. How many tests are pending? So, so thank you for that question. And we are updating our website on a daily basis. Sometimes they're not always the most up-to-date numbers because the, the numbers of people being tested are, are changing on a constant basis. So currently, um, our public health laboratory has tested approximately uh, 380 individuals for COVID-19. And out of those approximately 380 individuals we've tested in the last two weeks, the, uh, we've de detected the 13 positives. There are currently approximately 90 to 100 tests currently pending. Um, within our public health laboratories. Uh, and our mobile um, sampling team will be out in the community again today collecting more samples. So we've certainly ramped up the number of um, tests that we're, we're capable of doing. On top of this, we're also aware um, of some hospital laboratories potentially bringing on this testing more locally. There are the commercial um, or reference laboratories like Quest and LabCorp and Nordics um, uh, that have brought on COVID-19 testing. And so there, there is certainly um, the ability of, of providers to um, obtain COVID-19 COVID-19 testing either at a commercial laboratory or more locally um, at a hospital lab or through the, the New Hampshire Public Health Laboratories. And how many are being publicly monitored? Um, uh, it's, a, it's probably, I don't have the exact number. Again, this will be updated in, in a little bit. I would refer you to that for the most updated numbers, but I want to say it's on the order of two, uh, three to 400 people, I believe, that um, are, are being monitored. So that's Counts. gone down from yesterday then? Okay. What's so that? that? It was 425 yesterday. So if you're at 300, then that's gone. So, so I'm actually being told it's about four. It's 450 now. I'm sorry. Okay. I believe I. But counties, how many? Um, the, the 13 um, have they changed by? Um, are there any new counties that we have? So out of the um, 13 individuals that have tested positive for COVID-19, uh, three are from Grafton County. That was previously reported. Uh, one is from Hillsborough County. That's specific to the city of Nashua. And then the, the rest are from uh, Rockingham County. I wanted to ask the, the um, case that was announced on Friday evening um, appeared to the, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, came out with an advisory about the number of days in which that person was at a DMV uh, for large periods of time. Um, what is being done in terms of investigating all the possible contacts? Because it seems like a really wide field of potential contact if it was like five days for eight hours a day. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we are continuing to investigate the potential community exposures that the DMV um, has has been the exposures at the DMV have have been put out in the press release as you as you mentioned. Um, our public health nurses ha and our public health team have been working with. Um, the other state agencies, including the Department of Motor Vehicles, to uh, get uh, a list of employees that may have been um, exposed there, as well as other um, people that may have visited the DMV on those dates. Um, but I, I, I want to say that um, as we have more cases of COVID-19 identified in New Hampshire, um, you're likely to hear and see about more of these types of community exposures. And so I think it goes back to really relying on, you know, everybody to be monitoring for their own, for their health and, and symptoms. And if anybody starts developing even mild symptoms, fatigue, headache, chills, muscle aches, um, certainly if there's fever or cough or any difficulty breathing, that those individuals need to stay home. Um, and if they're concerned about their health or have progression of symptoms, they should be talking with a healthcare provider. Uh, and certainly there's the ability to test for COVID-19 out there. I have a question for the governor too. I'm mean, asking this at a press conference, but Governor Phil Scott, Vermont, on Friday as part of his emergency order, um, they issued a ban on events larger than 250 people in the state of Vermont. Um, given the situation in Vermont, given the situation in Massachusetts, and given the increased cases that we currently now have, are you entertaining uh, the idea of a similar order. No, not at this time. I mean, what we've seen so far is that communities and organizations across the state that have large events are canceling and, and postponing those events. Uh, they're making uh, good decisions based on their constituencies uh, and on the risk factors for those individual events. And I think that's, if anything, that's a credit to the people of the state of New Hampshire that we're not in a position that we would require a government mandate. But yesterday there was an event at the state house. Right, and then Friday night there was a scheduled fundraiser for Senator Shaheen that she only canceled at the last minute under pressure from the media. Uh, should political? I mean, you're you're a candidate. Would you have a yeah. big "We Love Chris Sununu" rally at this time? I, again, we're, we're we're most of those larger events uh, are being canceled and postponed. People are making the right decisions for themselves. But so yeah. people are making the right decision. I mean, mm -hmm. would it be in the public's interest for for the state to say hold off for a while? Uh, I'm sorry, well, well, I mean, you're saying people are making the right decision not having these events. Yeah. So if you believe that's the right decision, 
Yeah. Then why but they're making the yeah, decision, right? because they're making the decision based on their constituency, who's involved. I think they're uh, like you can have events with uh, a more elderly population. And obviously, they're going to be much more inclined to po postpone that event. Um, I mean, look, just we've reached out to conference centers. You have 80 to 90 percent cancellation through the month of April in conference centers all across the state. So the vast majority of cases out there are being postponed. People are, are making decisions on their risk factors that they see out there. I've asked about the testing in the past. Um, the Hospitals, what I've heard, and I just want to be very clear in the language of what I've heard is that hospitals have the capacity now to avail themselves of the private labs. Um, yes. Are you in contact with all of the major hospitals in the state? And are they all doing that? Beyond being having the ability to technically do it, are they actually doing it? So we're in constant contact with hospitals, both large and small. I was with the Rural Hospital Association uh, on Thursday and Friday. I was on the phone with Joanne Conroy as, as early as this morning, um, uh, Dartmouth, uh, who is the CEO of Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Uh, so there are hospitals that will be able to bring uh, potentially their own testing available within that hospital setting. Uh, but everyone, I think, appreciates, not just hospitals, but providers as well, appreciates that the LabCorp and the other private labs out there have a very quick turnaround time. The, it, the availability of testing is not the limiting factor in controlling the spread right now. It's really making sure that people understand the concepts of social distancing and, and uh, some of the you know, actions that the state is taking here. So uh, the good news is a lot more private tests are coming on. Uh, about a million and a half new tests will come online this week uh, with millions more on the way. We've, we've been speaking with the federal government, uh, everyone from the administration to Health and Human Services late last night. They're also providing a lot of flexibility. The FDA is being, creating a lot of flexibility within the tests themselves that can still ensure accuracy but actually allow more tests to be conducted, which is why why, again, the state, you know, we don't have a, a, we're not at a crisis point. The State Department of Public Health uh, primarily uses their tests for the most high risk and high need uh, instances. And the fact that of those most high risk, we've done hundreds of tests, we have 13 positive cases. In the coming weeks, we're going to see a lot of these individuals, uh, God willing, they're going to get better, right? They're going to get back to work. We're going to get those those negative tests as, as, as they get well. They're going to get back to work. And I think that alone is going to bring a, a, a sense of calm back to the situation as people start realizing the data we're seeing on the these graphs that even 80% of those that do get COVID-19 are going to be have very mild symptoms and and um, you know a very normal transition back into into their work life so and their family life so I think that as we kind of progress through this again just dealing with some of the questions earlier on you know the run on on, on supplies out of stores and all that I think that uh, again brings a, a general calmness to the situation as more schools go to remote learning uh, in the next in the coming weeks we'll be able to assess it and again we'll be able to really I think make some um, some decisions some, some really good long term decisions for the state given I, I think we've handled the short term issues very, very well. This has been a great team effort. Um, Bail resorts um again those resorts have to make those decisions on their own. The Mont's yeah. been having some trouble with um, a number of cases that they've been getting from Westchester County, people in their second homes coming up to Vermont and that had been seen as a trend there. Have you seen any kind of a trend of that where second homes are being used by people in more affected areas that are coming this way? I don't, I don't know. We're not aware of that, no. No, I'm not, I'm not aware of that. Right. As far as homeless shelters go, are you working with them to prevent the spread throughout their communities and their buildings and profits with that? Yep. So the the homeless, the, whether they're homeless shelters or you know various other organizations across the state that provide housing to to you know um, uh, individuals with uh, financial burdens right now, uh, they're in constant contact with the Department of Public Health. Uh, Commissioner Shibinet and her team have been working with them just so again they know the guidelines, the recommendations, uh, how to uh, em implore employ some of the aspects of social distancing within their communities and their networks. They're all a bit different. Uh, some are, are up north and they're small. Some are down south and they're they're, they're larger, some are in small cities, some are in rural areas. So um, we're kind of taking each of those on a one by one basis. So just one question on the DMV person um, that's it positive. How long was it between their expression of symptoms and were they tested? <coughs> what was the gulf of time? Uh, yeah, so I, I can't comment on specifics on, on any individual case, including specifics of date, but what, uh, dates of onset and when they were tested. But what I can what, what I can say is that um, we have identified um, a number of community exposures, like you saw the, with the DMV exposures, um, related to when when we believe the person was was symptomatic. The, the information of this, where this person was, made people kind of very helpful. Like when, when I was, when was I at DMV, et cetera. Do yep. we expect similar amounts of information about future victims, obviously not their name or their medical details, but 
where they were, when they were there. We did not get that about the first few cases, and I know a lot of people appreciated the information that came out about the DMV case. Yeah, I think that's a great question. The answer is yes. You know, we, we release um, information about potential public exposures uh, when, when we need to release information to identify people. Um, many times when we have identified somebody with COVID-19, uh, we're able to, either one, there were very minimal community contacts and we're able to identify specific people that um, are close contacts, like household members, family members, friends, for example, and we, we reach out to those individuals directly, so there uh, oftentimes is not a need for a broader communi uh, community notification. But uh, during the course of our investigation, if we identify um, public settings where someone with COVID-19 may have been during a period when they were either symptomatic or we believe that they were potentially able to transmit the virus to others, we will, we will be um, communicating that with the public, uh, and we're, we're working through a process to, to more um, expeditiously do that um, so the information is getting out there quicker and, and uh, more rapidly as we have more people identified within the within the state with COVID-19. As far as the DMV case, Dr. Chen, were there any other areas in the community that that person may have been or may have been in yeah. contact with? Or so, so we're still conducting um, the investigation and still uh, reaching out to this individual to, to identify if there were other community locations. Uh, we believe there, there may have been and we will release that information when we have it. Mr. Edelbluth, can you tell us a little bit about private schools? Um, how do they fit into this? Have you asked these people to go home? What's the story? So the same order applies both to the public schools as well as to the private schools. Most of our private schools have made the decision to um, switch to a remote instructional model, and they are implementing that as well. Uh, as a person who's advocated local control, I mean, this has been a debate that's been going on since the coronavirus began. Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut said he's mad that the president hasn't ordered all the schools shut down. And of course, that's contrary to a tradition of local control. Well, this is a pretty bold move for a Republican governor in his administration to seize local control of schools and shut them down. Do you have any concerns about the what that does to the established tradition here in New Hampshire of local control? So actually, we've been working very closely with the local officials and the local school leaders in making this decision. It is not something that is just made um, you know, arbitrarily. Um, I will tell you that we've worked with them locally to be able to implement these plans and to make those uh, ubiquitous uh, throughout the state to all of our students. And then I guess the other aspect relative to local control that I would um, maybe lean in on is really associated with um, you know, in many cases, they were receiving a lot of pressure from their communities to be able to do something, and we want to be able to support our local officials in making those decisions. So I think you can view this as a support measure as well for local control by supporting our local school leaders. Well, thank you guys very much. Again, this is, this is evolving. We're going to keep coming forward. We're going to keep having press conferences. We, one thing we want to do is make sure whatever information we have, it's clear, it's concise, it's being transmitted, it's very transparent uh, to the general public. We encourage everyone, if you do have a question, uh, whether it's about your own health, uh, please call 211. Our line is up and running 24-7. That's 211 to get information um, in terms of how, how we're moving forward. Also, if you have other questions, you can go to nh.gov backslash COVID-19. Uh, that site has some of the, the guidelines and um, we'll be po continuing to populate it as the, the situation evolves that has a lot of information really good information on it again we just want to remind people that uh, we all have a collective responsibility here when everyone in New Hampshire comes together we do it very very well we've been very successful so far uh, given the level of this health uh, this health scare it's an emergency to be sure uh, and we want people to know that we're here for them we're going to be transparent um, and one way or another together we are going to get through this so thank you all very much